Hello and welcome to How to See Spiritually with me, Mark Vernon, a series thinking about intuition and the eye of the soul. If you like the talk, please do share it, look at the other ones and feel free to make comments. And I thought that in this episode, we think about this word soul. Um, clearly, I'm making a lot of it in How to See Spiritually, so we need to get some sense of it. And what is tricky here, but what is the knack, if you like, um, is the soul is one of those things that you know it when you see it, um, you know it when you felt it, um, and so although it can be slippery to define up front, it becomes crystal clear when you do see it. Let me give, jump to an immediate example. Um, take the pictures of Vincent van Gogh. I think that a key part of why he is so much loved is that his pictures convey the soul of the scenes that he's capturing on canvas and in oils. I mean, take a picture like his Starry Night. The stars aren't just pinpoints in the sky, although we know exactly that that's what he's referring to. These are swirls of life that dance through the heavens. He's completely captured the star in the, in the, in the starry night with its soul as well as, as well as its physical presence. We'll take his pictures of wheat fields. Again, the wind blows through the wheat. The, we the, the wind sort of makes the clouds scuttle across the sky. And we know immediately that he's not just capturing a scene like a camera might. He's capturing the spirit of it. Um, and in particular, it's very interesting that the wind blows through the wheat. The wind blows through the clouds and makes them move across the sky. Because in many ancient languages, the word for wind and the word for spirit is the same word. It's pneuma in Greek. It's uh, ruach in Hebrew. And the, the link is made um, in other languages as well. And Vincent van Gogh completely directly communicates that. You're not just looking at wind in the wheat um, swaying. Um, you're not just looking at um, the wind moving the clouds across the sky. You're looking at the soul that animates the natural world, um, that, as it were, is implicit in the wind, um, that you can feel moving across the heavens. Um, it's even in his self-portraits, um, the number of self-portraits that he did, um, they capture the soul of the individual, um, not just um, what he might have looked like. Um, there's something about the use of oil um, that creates the slightly rugged, tempestuous sense of his soul. And yet there's a, a, a coming together as well there, there are rather beautiful, um, harmonious assemblages of colour. Um, that I think must say something about what he could perceive, what he could resonate, that enabled him to see the soul in the starry night, the, star, the soul in the wheat fields. Um, he managed to capture that in his self-portrait as well. So he's a good person um, to see soul, to know to, what you're looking at, to, to tune in to that felt sense of what the soul is. But let's try and be a bit definitional as well and, and say a little bit about what it is and what it is not. Um, I think one of the main problems we've had with this word is that for reasons I'm not entirely sure of, but in the modern world, um, soul has come to mean like a spark inside us that somehow lives on after our death, after our, our physical bodies expire and sort of floats off into another realm. Um, I don't think this really came about until the 17th century, maybe even more recently, actually. Um, it's sometimes blamed on Plato, uh, but he certainly didn't think of soul like that. Um, for him, soul was the animated element of life itself that somehow mediated between you and my particular life, which is present in a space and time located in a body, um, but that um, connects from that to the sense of life, spirit, the divine that rushes through all things and gives us our particular take on that. You know, it's our character, our personality, you might say, that's about our soul, um, rather than it being some sort of strange essence that somehow floats around inside of us. Um, it's the link between our immediate presence, our visible, tangible, touchable presence, and what you actually feel when you meet someone. That's, that's really their soul. Uh, and someone who is a bit dead inside feels like their soul has disappeared or contracted somehow. And that's why they feel a bit, a bit dead and, and not quite with you. Um, so soul is part of the, the continuity of being from the material to the spiritual. Um, it makes us who we are as individuals and connects us um, to this broader uh, sense of life as well. Now, soul can be seen in pictures, um, you can see it in a person, um, but you can think a little bit more about what it actually 
um, does, what it brings to life, um, by thinking about the soul in another um, common experience, the experience of music. Um, now, music on the one hand is very physical, material, it's notes, it's vibrations. Um, you can measure them with uh, physical instruments um, and pick them up with a microphone. But of course, what you and I hear when we hear music is not just individual frequencies of sound. We hear things like harmonies, we hear tunes, and we feel stirred um, in, emotionally, um, psychologically, spiritually. We feel taken on a journey. We feel that a side of life has been opened up to us when we hear music. And that, I think, is the soul of music. Um, it's, as it were, if you like, the music in the notes. Um, and C.S. Lewis um, had a very interesting way of talking about this. Um, he talked about the soul as being that which transposes from one domain to another. Um, from one experience of life to another. And music in particular is a key example of this. And because the soul of the music is what transposes it from just being mere notes to being a full symphony, to being a wonderful piece of music. Um, that transposition from, you might say, sort of from the higher domain, the music itself, to the very tangible, uh, measurable um, business of actually producing the notes, even recording and measuring the notes. Um, that transposition between domains is, is, is the soul of the music. And again, it's what we spontaneously and, and immediately relate to. Um, you can try a little experiment uh, on yourself if you like. If you load up a simple piece of music um, into a computer these days, you can turn down the tempo. And it's really interesting to see at what point the music ceases to be musical and starts just being sort of blocks of sound. And there's a kind of a cusp when almost like the soul of the music gets cut off from you as it slows down and down, and then you speed it up again and the soul comes back to life. Um, something's been transposed, to use C.S. Lewis's words, and, and that transposition of life itself is the domain of soul. Now, I think much as you experience it in music, um, you also experience it in poetry. You might say it's the poetry in the poem. Again, you know, poems at one level are just assemblages of words. But there's something about the way the words are put together that releases something more than just the sounds, so that the words themselves sort of release their soul. Um, the friend of C.S. Lewis, Owen Barfield, who is a big inspiration for me, he thought very much that words have souls. And as a philologist, as someone who studied words, he was very much into studying their life, their history, um, he thought they were actually fossils of our consciousness and they can tell us something about how things either were or how they are deep in our own souls by thinking about words. And the poem, um, the poet is the person who supremely does this. Um, take, take an example, very, very simple. Um, think of the phrase, old prophets, old prophets. Now, if I say that, it immediately conjures up in your mind uh, people with prophetic powers, perhaps wise people who lived a long time ago, perhaps were elderly themselves, you know, with beards and so and so on. Old prophets. It's descriptive. It's kind of like a, a sign um, that points back to these figures. But if I invert the words, make it more poetic, and say prophets old, prophets old, immediately a sense of soul comes in there, a sort of sense of vitality and liveliness. It's like I'm evoking the soul of the old prophets, when I say prophets old, in the soul of the words themselves, by inverting it, by putting the words um, in that order. The words um, release something of the soul of themselves and also that which they're um, evoking, that which they're pointing to. And it's this, this kind of thing which poets do all the time. I mean, the past master, of course, is Shakespeare. Um, the way that he can put words together, almost every phrase feels like it's releasing more to you than just the words themselves. Um, take a, a really nice example of um, his description of the morning. Um, which he calls a russet mantle that walks over the dew of yon high eastern hill. Now, morning is a russet mantle that walks over the dew of yon high eastern hill. I mean, what's that about? Um, you kind of can break it down a bit scientifically, the eastern hill, the sun rises in the east, and so on. But the use of the word russet mantle, um, you know, that kind of is releasing something of the spirit of the sunrise, and that walks over the dew. This is a kind of unfolding of... Um, eternity's sunrise, to use another great poet of the sunrise, William Blake's phrase, eternity's sunrise. Um, this is 
this is the soul released I mean the sunrise through the use of poetic utterance where so the words the everyday phenomena and our own receptivity to it the russet mantle that walks uh, yon high eastern hills um, you know exactly what the soul of the early morning is there that that, that moment just as the sun um, peaks up from um, on the other side of the horizon and life returns light returns and the turquoise of the sky and so on um, it's the soul of the sunrise that you know immediately when you see it. Um, I think Shakespeare was actually really alert to um, the, the back history of words too and how a phrase can release not just the immediate sense but um, something of the old senses as well. Um, one of his really interesting words um, that he uses a lot is ruin. Um, and I think Shakespeare lived at a time where the word ruin didn't just mean collapsed buildings, our ruin as we tend to use it now. Um, it also meant a kind of movement, um, because it comes from the Latin and then from the Greek, where ruin first of all meant um, to rush, um, to rush towards, and then also to fall down, um, to rush in a, a sort of downwards movement. So Shakespeare could use the word ruin not just to describe a static object, a ruin, but he could use it in such a way as to suggest the rush and the fall and the tumble into a ruin, a whole kind of movement. It's a very brilliant place where he uses this at the end of his play King John, um, where um, he describes Arthur um, falling or jumping off um, the castle battlements um, and dying in a heap on the ground. Um, and the Earl of Salisbury approaches him, discovers the body and kneels before him. And in that moment describes the young Arthur as a ruin of sweet life, a ruin of sweet life. And this is evoking more than just the description of a chap who's died. Um, it's talking about someone who's fallen, not just literally over the battlements, but has, has, has tumbled because of the events of life. Um, and then we in the audience feel it too. It comes towards the end of the play, in fact. Um, so the rush of the events in the play are becoming a kind of ruin in the tragedy. Um, a word like ruin has immense soul. A little bit of philology kind of opens that up explicitly. And then a figure like Shakespeare, a poet like Shakespeare, um, can, can, can capture it more or less directly, directly when in the moment of the play we hear um, a character say, a ruin of sweet life. So that's something about soul, um, what it does um, in terms of transposing a kind of higher, deeper, more spiritual perception of life into the immediate, the immaterial, and that which can be measured as well. It brings these two elements together. And it, it suggests something else about soul, which is really important, that soulful knowing is a kind of resonating. Um, it's not the accumulation of facts, useful though that can be, um, so as it were, one built on top of the other. But it's a kind of attunement that enables us to resonate with reality more and more. And that's what, we, what, what we're striving to do when we try to listen soulfully to music or um, hear the poem in a soulful way. It's, it's much more like trying to um, uh, tune in to what's going on in the words or in the sounds. Um, and I think this is really important because um, that means that we can care for our own souls. We can develop our own capacity to tune into things. Um, so it's not just that there's a soul in the world around us that can be mediated to us, but it can enliven our own soul. Um, I think it's why, you know, hearing a poem or going to a play, hearing a piece of music always feels expansive of life. Um, it's not just what we've heard about. It's not just what the play might have been describing in a historical sense. Um, it's that we've been exposed to the vitality of life um, in so doing. And our soul gets stirred up, gets a bit more tuned in, gets reinvigorated in the process of the soul of the play, the soul of the music speaking to us. Um, Barfield, again, had a very, very nice comparison here. He said that we're rather inclined in the modern world to think of ourselves as cameras. You know, cameras are like black boxes um, into which the light goes, captures a snap or an image, um, and uh, as it were, the camera is a view from nowhere. Um, it just is there to sort of grab, possess, hold, transmit. Um, uh, not a very soulful activity, um, he argued, particularly when compared to another um, uh, object. Now, you don't see them so much these days, but what, what, the object of the Aeolian harp. And the point about the Aeolian harp um, is that um, it's, it's, it's strings strung across a sound box, a bit like a violin, but without the, um, the stem of the violin. 
and to play the instrument it's placed um, in a window perhaps an open window or in a doorway so that the wind moves across the strings and and causes the sound to to emerge you know the resonance from the strings and the wind captured by the sound box um, so that you hear the sound of the wind through the aeolian harp and he thought that that is actually a much truer picture of what it is to be human and a human with soul than a camera because in a way what our task is in life is to tune our own strings, do some work on ourselves, you know, care for our souls for sure, but then place ourselves in life so that we can capture the wind of the life, the spirit around us, um, and then that can sing us as much as um, we sing ourselves. You know, life is not, as it were, for us to produce of our own volition so much as to tune into, um, to amplify, and to uh, retransmit um, like the Aeolian harp does with the wind, um, like the good poet can do with words, like the great composer can do with music. We also know this, I think, in a collective sense. Um, there's, a, there's, you know, a collective soul, um, the soul that we feel in crowds, the soul that we feel when we're sharing in rituals, um, the soul that we feel when we go to a great place that many people have been to before and feel its spirit afresh. Um, another Greek word can be very helpful just to kind of focus and capture this. Um, they talked about mathexis. And mathexis was the energy that an actor could transmit to an audience in a great performance. It was their charisma, you might say. Um, it's another aspect of this soulful dimension of life, the mathexis, the charisma. Um, we're not just hearing the words, but we're caught up in a whole spirit and swept along with it so that we feel the emotion and the meaning of the play in this deeper sense. So think about soul. Grab a picture by Van Gogh, immediately you see it. You know, it's not just the stars in the sky, it's the life of the stars swirling across the heavens. It's not just the wind in the wheat field. Um, it's the spirit, the pneuma, the ruach, that moves through all creation that he's managed to capture. Um, appreciate music and the poems and so on. Think about what the word order is doing to release the soul of the words, communicate something of the soulfulness of life. And um, get a felt sense of it, hold on to it. Um, people will often say, we don't know what the soul is. Do intervals have soul? There's all these kind of rational academic debates. But when you can tune in and feel soul and, and train yourself, care for your own soul so that resonates more and more powerfully, you never actually lose sight of it and it becomes a key part of seeing spiritually.